Barbara, you surprised everybody by finding some audio and video of a phone call. Um, and it was at that point. Can you describe that? Are you talking about the satellite um, audio? Is yeah. that what you're talking about? Yeah, we searched, Eric, Dave, and I searched very hard. I mean, we unearthed everything that we could. And then we had a guy who said, hey, listen, I have a box under my desk. You know, I was going to do this film 20 years ago. And he just sort of sent us the box, and we opened it up, and there were all kinds of treasures in it. So when you dig really hard, you find unbelievable stuff that nobody even knows exists. Yeah. Um, Stu, how difficult was it for the administration at that point to, to deal with a failed mission? Well, it was, first of all, very difficult for the president initially when he learned that the mission would have to be aborted. And it was a very, very close call. There had to be six helicopters, as Major Burris said. There were six. Uh, two had, on the way, not made it, but there were six. And the one, this is where Ed needs to come in, uh, had a hydraulic problem. And there was a question of whether uh, it could fly. The decision was made not to do so. But then the question was to Beckwith, will you go in with five helicopters and try the mission? And he decided that he would not do that. He needed six. He needed the extra 20 men to do it. A very close call. I mean, with all the training that was done. Well, and then I, the question came back to the commander in chief, the president, will you order the mission to go forward with five helicopters, all functional, the same plans as have been laid out uh, by, Ta by Taco and, and by Major Burris. Uh, and uh, the president said, I'll leave it up to Beckwith on the ground. And Beckwith said, no. So that was, that was a great disappointment. That was then the second disappointment was uh, learning that leaving would not be a clean mission. We really couldn't start over again when one of the rotor blades of the helicopter hit the C-130 filled with fuel. That was catastrophic for the president. He literally just put his hands, his head down on his desk. It was the worst of all possible outcomes. Uh, and, and in many ways, it was the end of the administration. It was a sort of metaphor for the failure of the administration. All the effort, all the courage, all the training uh, went for naught. I do want to make, if I may, and, and I want Ed to take over, I do want to make uh, one or two other points. The second is, for, the first is, as Ed will certify, and I got this in researching my book, uh, President Carter of the White House years, there was an utter lack of inter-service coordination, total, complete lack. Uh, for example, the Army general who headed the whole mission was denied permission to go onto the aircraft carrier to inspect the helicopters, although during many of the practice missions uh, in, the, in the desert in the United States, that had been the biggest problem. He was totally denied. There was radio silence going in, so the helicopter pilots couldn't talk to each other about the failures. But the utter lack of coordination was a problem. And this was, in fact, because we really didn't have a coordinated special forces unit. That came later with the Goldwater Amendment. Uh, it's one of the ways we were able to take Osama bin Laden out. So we did not have that. And that, that was a major factor, but I, I'm sure the vice president will, will describe how just unbelievably depressing it was to learn not only that was the mission aborted, but that our own people were killed trying to get out. Yeah. Mr. Vice President, I, uh, I'm just curious what your feeling was uh, at the time when the mission was uh, aborted. 
I was with uh, the president. Uh, Fritz, can you speak? I was, was with president in his office during these last uh, hours. And I, in, I've never thought himself with his hair and that it did Frozen. I'll tell you, I'm I'm having difficult difficulty hearing you. Um, I'll tell you what, we'll come back to you in just a second, uh, Vice President. Mike, I'm curious from your standpoint as a hostage, at what point did you all learn that um, there was a rescue attempt and that it failed? Um, I was in solitary when it happened. I had been from November until then in solitary confinement. So I had no contact with anyone at all until after the mission. I did not know about the mission at all for the time that I was in prison. I only found out much, much late, well, when we got out, when I got to Germany. Oh, wow. But I had very little contact with other hostages, just now and then. Ten of Why was you in solitary? Well, I did a lot of reading, a lot of exercising. But anyway, I did not know the, I don't know the answer to that. Various others, but we were kept in groups that weren't ever mingled together. When I was with someone else, it was always the same one or two people who had also been kept in solitary. Tony, try to get uh, Colonel Seifert in. He can tell you what happened with the helicopters. It's Ed Seifert on. I don't. Barbara, Buck I'm having here. trouble unmuting. Yeah. Can you inject something in here, please? Okay, there he is. 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 How are we doing now? Okay. Where'd you? I can't hear you. But uh, let me first digress a second and really uh, send my warm regards to Bucky and what he was able to do. He's a godsend. Also Dick Meadows and a whole host of others. Uh, my situation at the time when the embassy was taken, I was on independent duty in Sydney, Australia, not having the foggiest idea I would ever be engaged. So it was just a combination of things that on the 9th of November, I find, found out at Yuma that I would be engaged. Always knowing intuitively that the rotary wing aspect of this whole operation from a physical perspective was the weak link. And as uh, other people have annotated the piece, the uh, idea that we were uh, compartmentalized to the extent that it encumbered our ability to uh, get information, disperse information, and the fact that our folks at Yuma Proving Grounds didn't come anywhere. They came, they were sent from units without anything in their personal possession saying that they were going to do something. Uh, and when I arrived, they still had the same flight suit on that they had showed up with uh, up, say, the middle of November. The idea that that this compartmentalization took place or existed was tantamount to really not having to, the ability to exercise the coordination between the two air elements and the ground element. I, I, I'll, I'll reinforce one thing, Mike, even I have so much 
a great deal of respect for Charlie Beckwith and his ability to do what he did with Delta. And from a personal perspective, if Jim Kyle had not been the senior officer president there at Desert One and did what he did functionally, uh, we would have probably lost a lot more, any a higher number of fine Americans. So uh, I am not hearing anybody on my iPad. Okay, well, it looks like we just lost, uh, lost him. Um, Mr. Vice President, can you describe your feelings when uh, when the uh, rescue mission had to be aborted? I was, I was uh, distraught. Uh, uh, and uh, this was, you know, we, we had been fighting this issue for a long time. We, we thought that uh, you know, here were the United States of America we should be able to get this to work on. And then when we came down to the final moment, we could not. And um, we had uh, a disaster. And we had to just sit there and try to figure out what with our life after that. And poor Carter, he was really just This is so frustrating that we can't hear the vice president. Yeah. Um, one thing I'm I'm curious about from either uh, Lewis or, or Taco, how did you feel about the administration when the when things fell apart? Were there was there animosity towards the administration? There was not, my greatest concern and our greatest concern, the ground element, with the administration was the fact that uh, initially we were told to launch this operation from U.S. territory and return to U.S. territory with nothing in between. Well, that was a near impossibility in those days. It would have greatly lessened uh, the attempt to, to get it done. The other thing was some of the restrictions, for example, uh, here were 90 well-trained soldiers going to downtown Tehran, and we had the restriction that, for example, before we could engage anyone exterior to the embassy compound, they had to be engaged with uh, riot control agents first. And that, uh, that to me, uh, was sort of saying, you know, we don't. We trust you to go in and try to do this, but we don't trust you to use your discrimination. Uh, it made me wonder whether they think we're a bunch of knuckle drivers. Tell you the truth. And I, I, one thing I do need to say here: uh, the president was exactly right by leaving the, the decision to turn it up on the ground as to whether or not to go ahead with five helicopters. In the first place, first place, it would have been impossible. We were running out of darkness. We would have had to fly, fly north in broad daylight in this formation of five RH-53 helicopters and the, and the Iranians obviously would have seen it uh, and investigated it so that it would have been impossible to begin with. I had gone so far after about the first 90 minutes of that, the last helicopters not showing up uh, is to have Jerry Boykin do a map reconnaissance to try to figure out an alternate place that we might hide that first night and try to turn it into a three-night operation so that we could go from Desert One to an intermediate site, hide there, go to Desert Two a night uh, later than we had intended to. So it wasn't, uh, as I said, the president was exactly right to, to, as is usually the case when you let the guy on the ground decide uh, what to do, you're going you're gonna to have a, a better decision than somebody thousands of miles away. So I just wanted to make sure that's understood. It was not going ahead with five helicopters. Uh, number one, who are you going to leave behind? You know, which of the, because it was like a 
a ballet we had rehearsed. We knew who was going exactly to the building and so forth. Uh, but the main thing was the, the lack of, we were running out of, out of darkness. Yeah, talk how you feel the same. Anyway. Well, you know, the bottom line is you gotta remember, uh, back then, you know, uh, we pared down everything to the bare minimum uh, to be able to execute, you know, 6130s. We had spares back and spares of Bravo. Once you left the ground, it was the six of us, and that was it. Uh, so, you know, for our part, and the airplanes were full. You know, C-130 takes off uh, emergency war since Vietnam all the way to today at 175,000 pounds. My airplane, when we took off out of Oman, taking off after six in the evening and Bucky was in the back and he wasn't real sure either we weighed 196,000 pounds we, that airplane wasn't supposed to take off it was supposed to crash at the end of the runway so we had a lot of great things going for us great thing for a C-130 but we were maximizing everything we had because of footprint didn't have that didn't have much room to put uh, more than six C-130s in that space and, and, and eight helicopters so those were tough things uh, you know, the bottom line is, you know, it has nothing to do with the president of the United States, the vice president of the United States, or the or the staff. What happened that night in the desert was uh, an event that occurred that was absolutely horrible. Uh, you know, you've got that huge dust out there. Things happened. Uh, the tough part was we lost the Americans. No, that's the part that hurts. You know, it's, it had nothing to do with the decision because when we got back, it was must maybe two weeks. We were back training for desert, too. We were full on uh, uh, doing rehearsals to a different direction, different airfield seizures, different all kinds of stuff. Uh, we did that uh, all the way up to the inauguration of Reagan. So, I mean, we flew our butts off uh, what was now called the Honey Badger. You know, uh, it, it's different. But, you know, out of those ashes, uh, going back to what uh, was said earlier, you know, uh, command and control and everything else, out of those ashes, Came some great things. Force Program 11, US SOCOM, uh, MARSOC, NASA, because now they're all controlled by one force. They've got all the same intel, all the same communication, and it doesn't make a difference who's the four stars in charge. We all, as we say, and you know, our, the bad part about it all, which still festers today, and it'll fester, I think, forever, is, you know, we're the purple service. You know, you got members from the Army, you got members from the Air Force, you got members from the Marine Corps, you got members from the Navy that are all part uh, operationally controlled in the U.S. SOCOM, but administratively controlled by the United States Army, the United States Air Force, United States Marine Corps, United States Navy. So it makes it tough because you're serving two masters. But we're all focused on one thing. We know what the mission is. And if you look what happened since then, uh, they've created some, uh, carried off some of the most fantastic uh, Mission saving American lives, taking out the the, the right target uh, at the right time. So, you know we've come a long way, and uh, you know I'm proud. Of it. Uh, you know uh, the other piece that came out of that is we created the Special Ops Warrior Foundation to take care of the families of all those kids that were killed. We had 17 after that night. And we've been doing this since 1980, and we're still. You know, we still have special operators killed in harm's way every day, and we take care of their children. And it's a uh, it's a monumental task. Yeah. Um, Ambassador Eisenstadt, I was going to ask you a question about the negotiations uh, with the Iranians. How did how did that work? And were there any indications that the incoming administration was um, doing anything, uh, any involvement with them? Tony, this will unfortunately have to be my last answer because I have to go. But I, I think the problem was uh, we weren't negotiating with the real decision maker. Uh, the real decision maker was Khomeini. Uh, he refused to negotiate. He refused to see the UN mission that had been carefully arranged to come, do an inspection, get the hostages transferred into government control and out of the student control uh, because he was using the hostages as political pawns. Uh, and so the, there actually were several agreements with Bonnie Sauter, 
and with others. Ham Jordan, the chief of staff, even disguised himself uh, and had secret meetings with two French lawyers who were given the authority, we thought, to reach a deal, and he reached a deal in Paris. But each time a deal was brought back, Khomeini would say no. To this very day, his successor, and there have been only two Ayatollah, Ayatollah Khomeini and Khomeini, won't meet with any foreign officials. Zero. No Arab, no Muslim, no Western. And so we were we were negotiating with people who couldn't make a decision. And this made it extraordinarily difficult for the president. That's what led him in the end to call for the hostage rescue effort because he realized by March, January, February, March of 1980, that there was not going to be an agreement, that we simply couldn't negotiate with these people. And in the book that uh, Colonel Kyle wrote, The Guts to Try, that's a very good way of putting it. Uh, I think it could have succeeded, but it was a gutsy effort. We had very courageous people like uh, Mr. Sanchez, Mr. Burris, and Colonel Seaford. There was exquisite planning. There was a lack of operational control and compartmentalization, yes. But it was a very gutsy decision because we couldn't negotiate with anyone able to make a decision. Now, where are we in 2020? In a very similar situation. With Khomeini still being the ultimate decision maker, Rouhani uh, and his foreign minister uh, are relative moderates. but any ultimate agreement has to be made by Khomeini, the most radical element controlled by the Revolutionary Guard. So that was the problem then. It's the problem in 2020. Did you get any indication that the incoming um, Reagan administration was talking to them as well? Well, this is a very controversial subject because they kept saying during the 1980 election, we were going to pull an October surprise and get the hostages out before the election. It's now alleged, and I want to make it clear, alleged, there are congressional hearings on it, there's a new book, that Reagan's own uh, campaign manager, who Jim Baker, uh, his campaign director, admitted in my, uh, in my book, uh, was uh, had stolen our debate book, that he went to Mexico, allegedly, and met with Iranian officials and said, don't release the hostages, it'll help reelect Carter. Again, there were congressional hearings on that, it was never determined, but there is a new book with additional evidence on it. I don't want to say that that was certainly the case, that was the allegation. But what is clearly the case is that we reached an agreement after the election, and the Iranians refused to release the hostages, Khomeini, until the very moment that Reagan was sworn in. Ham Jordan and Jerry Rafshoon had from uh, the White House a uh, signal connection with Phil Wise, uh, who was then his chief of staff, on the platform when Reagan was being sworn in to see if they would release the hostages on Carter's walk and to rub it in the hatred that Carter, that uh, Khomeini had for Carter for supporting the Shah and letting him in for medical treatment, he released them only the second that Reagan was sworn in. Now, Reagan, in a gesture, I think, of goodwill, allowed Air Force One to take Carter to meet uh, the hostages in Germany. Uh, Michael can talk about this. It was a very mixed reception. Some thanked him and some blamed them. Didn't realize how much effort the vice president and president had put and they tried to get them released over 444 humiliating days. And if you want to know why we lost the election, it was because we were humiliated by a fourth-rate power, and we couldn't get them out. And then the hostage rescue failed, again, as a metaphor for somehow failure rather than a gutsy try. So the long and the short of it is, Tony, we were negotiating with people who couldn't make a deal because Khomeini vetoed it. And we have a similar situation now 40 years later.
Ambassador, hey. thank you. I think you said you had to go. I am curious, Mike, um, for two things. Um, mm -hmm. What it was like for you when you found out you were going to be released and then how difficult was it for you personally to actually get released? <laughs> I apologize again for having to leave. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Vice President, much. it's always a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Number one, um, we weren't sure what was happening. I had been taken out of solitary. I now had a cellmate. And we were, I was uh, actually in a guest house that had formerly, formerly belonged to the uh, prime minister uh, with bars on the windows and, you know, metal sheets attached to the windows so that we couldn't see outside. But we were starting to get visits from uh, the, Red, the Red Cross. Uh, you know, some Swedish officials came in to see us. They weren't allowed to talk to us. Algerians came in to see us. They could only ask questions about our health and our welfare, nothing else. They would not give us any other information. But the guards were starting to suddenly get very funny and uh, as in, gee, um, you might be leaving soon. And we were also all taken and they did video, you know, films of us or, you know, they put us on film. They wanted us to talk about how pleasant it had all been. You'll notice that my film has never been shown. <laughs> <laughs> like my film of my meeting with Khamenei, I was I also met with Khamenei and had a discussion with him, the president, the man who's now, you know, uh, the supreme leader. That film would also never be shown, at least not by the Iranians. It was not as pleasant for him as it uh, might have been. But it was up until the very last minute, Iranian games, possibly with games all up and down the line. I don't know. But we did get released. But, you know, it's rather strange. The release, I don't think any one of us, I certainly did not, understand the depth of the emotion in the United States. When President Carter and Vice President Mondale came to Wiesbaden, I would, you know, my parents had told me to be very nice to President Carter, that he really worked hard on this, and I couldn't understand why they even had to say something like that. It's like, well, of course, he's the president. I don't recall anyone walking away. I certainly didn't. I have a great photograph of myself with the two of them. But it, I guess, depended on whether people want to blame themselves or want to find someone else to blame for problems. Uh, I was responsible for being in Iran. I wasn't going to blame President Carter for not getting me out more quickly. So that was that. I will say, by the way, that um, the release was a bit strange. I'll give you one story about it that I don't think I've really told people about. I had a, a big stack of telephone messages. Remember the days of telegrams? I had a big stack of telegrams and messages you know, from people who had called me. I called my mother and father. I called my brothers up because we had free phones. Thank you, Air Force or, you know, Army. But most of my messages were from Iranians, old Iranian friends. One that I came across, you know, immediately was from Iranian friends who had been revolutionaries in Iran and asking me to please call them immediately that they were now in Germany. So that day I called them up. And uh, my friend who had been an Iranian, he had been a revolutionary a real revolutionary, said, you know, Michael, we're now living in Germany. We're up in Hamburg. You must come up here. You have to come up here now. It's very, very important. And I explained that I was in the hospital, that it was a bit difficult, et cetera. He said, no, there's someone here who wants to talk to you. And you have to come. It's really, really important. I said, who is it? He said, Imam Khomeini's daughter is here. She's staying with us, and she wants to talk to you before you go back to America. Uh, when I heard that, I said, you know, if I come up there now and the press finds out, and they will, I will never be able to go back to America, and she will never be able to go back to Iran. You'll be stuck with us for the rest of your life as house guests. <laughs> so, who knows? Even in the Iranian government, even in Khomeini's office, Presumably in his family, there were people who were opposed to all of this. Uh, 
it's one of those things that we'll never know. Oh. You you almost yeah. missed the plane. I almost missed the plane because I was doing my best to not screw it up. I have a temper. I've always had one. I used to exercise ferociously in Iran in the you know in the cell so that I could work off my aggression that way. And I kept telling myself, if we're going, don't say anything, don't do anything, don't screw it up. Because the number of times I've been hauled off to other places and beaten for saying things. Anyway, we were on a bus. I knew it was a bus. You know, the buses have big steps and you're walking down this aisle and I could hear the sound of people rustling and sort of, you know, moving and breathing in the background. And I got all the way to the back of the bus and I sat down and there were two people behind me. I was blindfolded, by the way, the whole time on the bus. Everyone was blindfolded. Two people started to whisper, and they started to whisper loudly about, are we going to the airport? What's going on? Do you have any idea? You know, what's happening? And the Iranian guard just yelled out at them. He said, you know, shut up, you Americans. And then, you know, he said, shut up. And then he said, you American bastards. And I just automatically responded, shut up yourself, you know, you son of an Iranian prostitute. And they took me off the bus and the bus went. But the commander of the guys came over, you know, why isn't he on the bus? He insulted us. He insulted my mother. And the commander started to scream at the guy. And, you know, I don't care what he said. He has to be at the airport. So they rounded up a Mercedes Benz, and I rode out on the back seat of a Mercedes Benz. <laughs> and it was the only way to leave Iran. <laughs> That's great. We're going to start winding up. One thing I did want to do uh, for Barbara and David and Eric, um, in watching the documentary, there are some shots, some photographs that you used after the, the, the fire, after the, the crash. They're concerned about using those, and I think you know which ones I'm talking about. I do. Yeah. And do you have a do you have a, a concern about the way that was used? Who? I, that's for us, Barbara. Oh, okay. Um, are you talking about um, the bodies? The, the bodies of the victims. Sure. By the Iranians. What what yeah. Yeah. using using fire victims? Um, I felt that it was very important to show it to show what happened to show that when you get into these kind of situations, you know, sometimes people die, and I didn't want to homogenize what people had gone through and the grief that they had gone through. And so I felt it was very important to show that. Mr. Sanchez? Yes. <laughs> Your feelings? Barbara knows that uh, we've had discussions. Uh, and I told her, well, you have to understand, there's a lot more footage than what's actually in there. There's some even worse footage uh, that, uh, mm -hmm. that. But, you know, for me, it brings back very raw, it's like it was yesterday, memories. And uh, as I told Barbie, I said, I can live through it. I don't like it, but I understand why. Because it's, uh, you know, one thing you have to remember about this documentary is it, it, it encompasses all aspects of it, you know, uh, to include the Iranian side. So, you know, whether we like it or not, they did have a side and a reason why they did what they did, which we don't like at all of this drama. But to put a documentary together where you end up with the Iranian Thing that shocked me the most in the whole damn thing was they, the, that desert site is now a damn big uh, uh, like it's Six Flags over Texas you know and, uh, we all go and party every year uh, it's amazing but you know I think as I told Barbara the, the key is and, and what they did was make sure that it shows graphic content because you know there, there are a lot of generations of special operators now children that know us that were there that want to see the movie, that have children. And uh, I said, there's a piece in there that I don't think is, uh, it, it's it, it's not for the young at heart because 
you know, they're in a graphic, uh, very graphic position, and they're both the Marine guys and the Air Force guys. And, uh, that, that's a I understand why she put it in. I just don't like to look at that part. I close my eyes. Yeah. David, you were going to say something? Well, I just think it's important just to say that this was a decision that was hotly debated, and ultimately we landed on a decision that we just had to respect. This was not taken lightly whatsoever. We respect every single thing that Taco just said. That was all discussed. And sometimes you just have to make decisions. But you, you, you need. we did decide that we felt that the reality of what took place had to be presented. Um, maybe some of us debated whether how much, how little, et cetera. But ultimately, as a team, we stand by it. And uh, it was not something that was taken lightly in the least. It was the most hotly debated part, probably, of the final film. Well, well, it definitely puts it in perspective what the result was of that night. Yeah. Well, as we as we wrap up, one thing I did want to uh, have Barbara say is, uh, for people who have not seen the the documentary at this point, um, how will they be able to to see it? Is it going to be streamed? Is it going to, what's the distribution? That's a good Eric question. <laughs> Eric? Yeah, Eric, here. Uh, I'm here. Thank you. Yeah, we're working with, uh, you know, the, the idea is to slowly build momentum when you release these projects in stages. So it started off on the festival circuit and you get in front of a cinephile kind of audience and then you go into a cinema release, which we're in the middle of right now for theater goers um, and on September 4th, it will be available, uh, something called transactional video on demand. So available to rent on iTunes, Amazon, on your cable provider. And that'll last a number of months until history eventually um, puts it onto, onto broadcast television. So if you go to desertonemovie.com, you can find out all the details there on where to see it. That's great. Well, I appreciate everyone taking their time. Uh, Barbara, Eric, David, uh, Vice President Mondale, Ambassador Eisenstadt, and I apologize that we were never able to really get Jerry Rafshoon connected where we could do it. But uh, I mean, Mr. Sanchez, Mr. Burris, Mr. Sefer, uh, and Mike Matrinko. Um, it's just, it has been, for me personally, fascinating to be able to, to talk to you all and, and listen. I just, I really appreciate all of your all time uh, uh, this afternoon and thank all of our, our viewers. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. It's nice to see everyone. Thank and you. And thank, thank you, Vice President Mondale, for coming on.